Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, welcome to this hybrid seminar of the uh, Illiberalism Studies Program at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. Delighted to host you both in person and virtually for this uh, uh, great discussion on unpacking the logics of illiberalism by analyzing discursive shift. And I think what you will be learning from uh, our discussion today, and I think that's really a, a key point of the current discussion on the, the rise of illiberalism uh, um, globally, and especially in Europe, it's how much the kind of the mainstreamization of uh, uh, language is the key element for understanding uh, uh, what is happening and the kind of blurriness of borders between what was before considered as the classic far right and the kind of the classic right and how all these kind of discursive shifts are kind of uh, uh, blurring the, 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 the lines and the, the notions, uh, the semantic space that is uh, uh, used now. And for that, we have with us our uh, colleague, Mikhail Grzyzanowski, who holds the chair in media and communica communication studies at Uppsala University in Sweden. Is also there the deputy head and associate head of the Department of Informat Informatic and Media and is the director of research at the Center for the Multidisciplinary Studies on Racism. And so he has been working on this kind of critical discourse studies in communication in the context of politics of discrimination, exclusion, and social inequality. And for those of you who follow uh, uh, well these domains, I think the, the, the Uppsala universities, and especially there is a long Swedish academic tradition of uh, 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 doing kind of critical discourse studies and especially looking at uh, uh, racism and far right. So Mikael, thank you so much for being with us today and I give you the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me, Marlene. Thank you to European uh, Institute of European Russian uh, Eurasian Studies and especially Liberalism Program for, uh, for having me today and for the possibility to, um, to, um, to present my work. This is essentially work which, which, which comes from um, as you say, quite, quite a few things we've been doing, we've been doing recently um, in terms of probably trying to unpack the, 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 the connection between liberalism, uh, normalization and, and, and the politics of, of, of exclusion in the context of what we can probably call, should call the rise, the, the more global rise of the um, of the far right. Um, so, so probably what I'll be talking about today has, has, has already been published quite, quite extensively, especially in different works about the processes of normalization in uncivility, um, politics of exclusion. And it's also part of, of a current project which I'm undertaking in, in, um, in Sweden, which is about the immigration and normalization of racism, and how, especially in the context of, of far right. But I think, as we know, also this wider intellectual social illiberal we may say mood um, um, this is this is really this has been really developing um, so probably just to just to create a bit of a bit of a bit of order maybe in in, in, in where I in where I really sit I, I would I would say that of course we we all operate intellectually uh, within within different uh, notions and I would say that that the work the wider work on illiberalism probably probably serves for many of us as as, as, as a wider framework of thinking um in general in in a transnational in, a, in, a, in a, also in a theoretical and conceptual way um about um about about what's been what's been happening around us of course there is also a huge amount of work on, on the so-called mainstreaming of the far right uh, this would probably be somewhere intermediary in this in this my vision or my model of things um, and I would essentially see mainstreaming as a much more political institutional process. So, so process describing much more in, um, probably political dynamics that 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 result from from we may say illiberal politics, ideologies, and wider liberal logic. Um, and and I'm specifically probably sitting in this in this in this um, low at, at this lowest level. So in the work on on normalization. So normalization is probably is probably a description of a much deeper social process, social impact. Uh, of of illiberalism, which to, to to my mind very often, of course, is part and parcel of mainstreaming processes, but also it is something that in various ways precedes and follows mainstreaming processes. So it's something where we try to probably attempt to 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 respond to that question. You know, what 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 was the propensity we may say in the wider society for actually um, 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 developing, adopting we may say liberal ways of thinking, liberal. Uh, illiberal politics, policies, and 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 so on and so forth. But also, what is the deeper underlying change? So basically, that change dynamics of norms, which happens in relation to 
in relation to um, illiberalism. Um, as, as a very quick aside, normalization is actually something which I've been hearing from early childhood, and it's it's always been it's always been something which make, which has, has been making me very cautious. Yeah, so whenever I hear normalization, I know this is not about normal at all. Yeah, so so the first time I ever heard the word normalization was actually in the in the very 1980s, when after the, the crushing of solidarity by Polish Polish communist rulers back then, we had a, a huge media and political discourse about how yes things have happened, but normalization is already setting in. And I think and I think that was something that I found I always found quite complex and 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 quite challenging because on the one hand we had those whole we may say nominal expressions of of new normality but on the other hand we saw you know tanks in the streets and 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 and, and of course people people dying many things happening which which were not at all normal so in a sense I've I've, I've always knew that in a sense when I hear the word normalization that would be something about some kind of normalization of something that that is probably profoundly and and, and deeply unnormal. Um, in more recent years, probably my, my interest into normalization has went has went from the point of view of this of this process when when suddenly, especially media and, and political wider public discourse has started kind of this this, this train spotting of 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 of, of things becoming normalized. Yeah? So suddenly, media were writing about the fact that wow, in, in this country or in that country, so many people think racism is okay, or so many people think that discrimination or exclusion is okay. But in a sense, with no questions asked about where this has come from, how this has developed over time, and what has led, what have been the triggers, what contributed to this to this, we may, we may say, atmosphere of, of incitement. And it's very interesting because very often, and this is the case of the British press, they would write about the Italian situation, but they would, of course, miss that for years they themselves have been creating, we may say, we may say pumping a certain moral types of moral panics, which was obviously in their economic, political, and any other interests, and, and, which, and which over the years, of course, become incredibly swollen, eventually, of course, le leading to such huge eponymous we may say liberal projects like for example brexit in the in the united kingdom which obviously had a very deep and very very profound um, um we may say anti-immigration and exclusionary and exclusionary undertone but i think the consideration about normalization is also vital from the point of view that this is not only just talk this is not only just discourse we may say this is not only just narration of something but this is also a process which which very often has a a very significant spillover moment. Yeah, it's, it's a process which, which very often, in fact, leads to uh, to those to those moments when this discourse, we may say, hits the streets. When it becomes an element of, of wider of wider social political action, it becomes a tool, a pre-legitimatory, we may say, we may say, element of 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 of, of for, for 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 various activists politicians and um, various probably angels of the far right appearing and telling us yes that there are those crises on the one hand but of course we will tell you how to how to deal with them but it's not only this because then again once things become normalized once a liberalism i think becomes normalized and discursive we may say gradually introduced it also leads to a certain much softer we may say looking discourse which doesn't look radical anymore kind of doesn't alert us anymore but becomes also very dangerous this has been the case i think in many countries with with this nativist discourse on um, which, which is which which still speaks about them but with a very interesting nominal focus on us yeah so in a sense on our money our economy our borders and again, this has been something that that can very easily be used and mobilized in such projects as as, as more recently Brexit. So what I've been interested in has been this this process. I'm, I'm a discourse analyst, communication scholar. I migrated through several disciplines in my life, political science and so on and so forth. Um, and and, and but my interest has been especially how we may say this discourse evolves over time, because what we very often see is, is probably the last element of it, this, this element when things already are around, when things are already normalized, when things are not anymore questioned. Uh, but what effectively <clears throat> I'm interested in is, is always trying to see this, this as a longer process. So, of course, something which is being profoundly but purposefully and strategically, we may say, dehistoricized in order for us not to see where things have come from, who are the agents of particular, of particular types of change. 
so that 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 has especially been been my uh, been my interest and and of course we we have a lot of we have a lot of inspirations which we can which we can take from social theory discourse theory um, and social research about about the process and logics of, of normalization starting from probably the, the classic stuff such as Michel Foucault's idea on on normalization developed in his history of sexuality when he talked about the, this important and before things are normalized classifications, distinctions, differentiations between people are being introduced, and also some vision of post-normalization order um, uh, is, 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 very often, is very often being presented. There is also a lot of discursive, when we say micro or discursive work on, um, on normalization, but famously also colleagues working on discourse and ideology, Norman Furkler, for example, have, have spoken about the so-called naturalization of, of ideologies into elements of non-ideological common sense. And I think that's a particular problem of, of normalization research. There has been a lot of work, we may say previously, about radical language, hate speech. So, and this obviously is a very significant part of it, but it's not the only part of it, because actually normalization is not the discourse which in itself is radical, but it is a discourse which probably much deeply shows that the change of norms has already occurred and the radical has already been, so to speak, accepted. But in the, in the, in the works which, again, can serve as inspirations, of course, there's this quite extensive body of work on the normalization of violence and also um, a lot of work about the particular dynamics, we may say, certain logics in which in which the discourse, the discourse of liberalism operates, how it is, how it is introduced. Jürgen Link quite famously spoke about the so-called interdiscourse, that actually when those discourses very often emerge, it's not one particular social site or social field. It's actually in between different things. And if we look at, for example, how, how liberalism operates today, we will see it's, it's, it's an intellectual project as much as a, we may say an everyday project, as much as a political and a policy or even legal obviously project and so on and so forth. So, so it is about a combination. And then a, a, a lot of colleagues, most, most, most famously Ruth Vodak, they also have been, have been thinking about this, this, this normalization as a certain move of discourse, certain profound change, deep change of discourse from acceptable to unacceptable um, ideological positions. Of course, the notion of moral panics is also very important. I'll be brief about this one. We, we, know, it, we know it so well. So actually, the very classic, we may say, notion, mechanics of moral panics is, is that thing that, that, that happens very much in the process of, of, of developing different discursive shifts. Because moral panics was profoundly about, in a sense, instigating this, this, this whole scare, threat vis-a-vis -vis certain social, social groups and social processes, famously in the 60s and 70s against, for example, youth subcultures. Yeah? But the, the biggest problem with moral panics is also, and that's what, what Stan Cohen spoke about in his classic work on, on, on folk devils and moral panics, is, is the problem that very often moral panics outlives those groups with, in relation to which, to whom it was created. Yeah? So very often it's about a certain mechanism which stays in society of, of exactly creating threats, of, of creating, we may say, scapegoats, of creating, um, of creating moral panics. So my thinking has been that normalization probably as, as seen as element of, of discursive shifts, um, is a description of a simultaneous or subsequent discursive strategies which gradually introduce or perpetuate in public discourse some new, and most cases on civil or untrue, patterns of representing social actors, processes, and issues. And these strategies, more importantly, are initiated and recontextualized and as part and parcel of wider, most cases predetermined, social, political, and economic action designed to not only gain, to not, to not only in a sense change of norms, but also we may say profit uh, from that change of norms to gain legitimacy for, but also from, 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 from a certain alleged new, um, new, new normative order. But very importantly, the way this works is, is also through this process of creating the so-called borderline discourse, which I've worked with colleagues for, um, on, on for quite some time. So this process where exactly, it's not about, about expectation that we would see something radical. No, a liberal discourse in most cases, and that also comes from, from probably classic, from, for example, your work about the liberalism. A liberalism is not about radicalism. A liberalism actually acts from within. It works within the confines of, we may say, acceptable public discourse, within the confines of acceptable liberal democratic, we may say, no, um, processes and procedures. So the problem is that, a liberal discourse very often will be hidden within this thing that, that we call borderline discourse. So this discourse, which we may say remains uncivil in what it proposes, proposes, for example, discrimination, exclusion, inequality, 
but does so by grooming those ideas in a language which is seemingly civil and acceptable. So, so, so it is a stretching of norms and not the breaking of norms, when I say linguistically or discursively. And that is, and that is what makes it what makes it particularly particularly complex because it, it's not easily recognizable, we may say analytically, as problematic, challenging. But of course, it's a deeper, including historical contextualization and deconstruction, which we need, which we need in order to, to have that language. And illiberalism, lastly, is also very often introduced by means of so-called of so-called of so-called proxy discourses. So discourses which carry it. A lot of, for example, racism, discrimination, exclusion now actually does not arrive under those headings. It arrives, for example, under discussions about, I don't know, criminality, for example, yeah? actually fueling a very classic, we may say, racist public discourse pattern about claiming that them, whoever them really are, are, are criminal. But of course, but of course, those proxy discourses are extremely helpful. And it's the same idea also from my work actually with Natalia Krzyzanowska, which, which, which also we called conceptual flip side. And that's also a whole challenge, I think, of a, a liberal discourse nowadays, is that this discourse to a large extent has taken liberal democratic notions and flip-sided them in the in, in in its own favor yeah so so to speak the liberal democratic counter discourse cannot be created because it lacks its own language which we may say have, would have been stolen by now so to speak, to speak very plainly so let's take for example values such as um, well, for example freedom of speech yeah that's that's one of the biggest debates we're facing now but it's not it's it's, it's coming actually from the we may say illiberal thinking as 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 something which 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 has been flip sided and and we may say extensively in a liberal favor. So what I wanted to, to focus on very briefly today is is the example of Poland. Poland, of course, has been this has been this very uh, very radical, very very visible case when where 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 in last probably seven eight years a certain discourse has been has been not only introduced but subsequently also of course gradated perpetuated and effectively normalized poland we may say until around 2015 did not really have much of a discourse about immigration as such of course it had other discursive tradition i'm going to mention them in, in just a second but but as such there was no huge coherent wider public discourse about 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 migrants and immigrants in particular as people arriving in the country but within just a few months in 2015 we 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 went from this to effectively this. So a discourse which already started to started to remind, we may say, we may say a lot of discourse which we anti-immigration discourse in the public domain, which we know from other countries. The talk about, of course, huge numbers of, of migrants and refugees arriving, claiming and framing them as, 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 as invaders, yeah? claiming them as, as, as some sort of part of organized invasion, as terrorists, as criminals, um, and so on and so forth. So a good question has been for me, and that's actually where my thinking about normalization again and discursive shifts have ha has, has started, was, was to think where has this suddenly come from yeah? and, and how can we actually try and, and trace this process back in order to see how gradually, by means of different things adding up, by different sort of, in a sense, snowballs being, being, being created and gaining velocity, how this really, um, how this really has um, um, has happened. So the challenge of doing this research in Poland is, of course, that we can say, yes, there was no discourse about immigration, but let's be honest, there's a, there are a huge discursive tradition of discriminatory, we may say, illiberal, anti-pluralist discourses. Yeah? So discourses, discourses related to, obviously, anti-Semitic discourse, sexist, patriarchalist discourse, homophobic discourse. So there is there is there is enough to there is enough to, to draw on but but and, and secondly also also another thing that's very important is that poland has had actually a, a migration related discourse was emigration related discourse about poles which had a slightly um when they say nationalistic undertone but what's happened in the last few years has been the enactment of a particular discourse about immigration which very quickly was turned in that more anti-immigration and and ever more radicalizing anti-immigration direction and effectively in that form it has been we may say perpetuated and and then normalized of course the political context is very important here because in the last few years a lot of political we may say developments in the country have clearly facilitated this but also obviously have clearly built on this so so we had different outposts we may say of, of power gradually taken over by by the far right in polish case that would be the peace party and and effectively and effectively and effectively we may we may say we may say gaining full control 
of the legislative process, but also of the wider public discourse, of public media. Um, so, so all of this obviously, obviously adding fuel to, to, what's, to, what's been, to what's been recently happening. But interestingly, we also have to consider those specific political actors that, that, that far right, that far right party, which at the moment um, um, is, is leading um, in Poland, as, as, as something which in itself is a lot of borderline discourse. It's a party which traditionally has been, we may say, we may say, doing 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 things uh, which 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 would be which could be well seen as contradictory. Yeah? So things they would say they would claim to be obviously Christian and Catholic, but denying humanitarian help. Yeah. So so and 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 doing many other we may say paradoxical paradoxical things. What would also happen is that peace in itself would also be a very much of a discursive shift. Over the years, starting from, probably from its, from its antecedent party, the, the PC in, in, in the 1990s, it would be a party that we would see a gradual development of ideologically up to this most recent periods from 2015 onwards, when it has rather clearly turned into this more ethno-nationalist, anti-immigration, xenophobic, and including Islamophobic um, um, logic, and, and of course we also know different areas of, of its of its kind of activity in terms of law dismantling of the constitutional system, and and so on and so forth. So the analysis which we have done started started from actually looking at how peace on its Twitter official Twitter was was talking about immigration in that very initial period when that discourse started to emerge very strongly, and this was the period in September and October two thousand fifteen. So a period which probably is a coincidence of many things. Uh, on the one hand, the uh, Polish pre-election national parliamentary election campaign in 2015, which brought peace to power and which it has remained ever since. Uh, but it's also a, a period when, when obviously the so-called refugee crisis peaks in Europe and different countries had to debate in a sense their positions, their, their possible refugee quotas and so on and so forth. And bear in mind Polish quota was extremely low and, and, and even less than this was um, even, even fewer um, refugees than this um, were, were, actually, uh, were actually accepted. I'm not sure if I'm something with my wife right now. We still have it there. Can you see me? So no, but I can't, it, can't move. Can you move the slides on the computer? On my yes, but I yeah, but at least I mean, okay. if, he, if the Zoom, if we cannot share slides, at least share screen, oh, yes, people course. can see it from there. There's something with the network connection. Yes, so yeah. sorry for this. Sorry for this. So indeed, so we get we did that analysis of peace, which actually pointed very quickly, uh, um, recapping, um, um, pointed to of course certain certain few few important moments when the party started, of course, describing different. Um, different um, um, different elements of, of 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 kind of creating, we may say, this immigration related discourse. The first part of it happened in the Polish Parliament when Jarosław Kaczyński, in one of the the parliamentary debates about the refugee crisis and Polish Polish national national, uh, we may say, reaction to the refugee crisis, um, has has started talking about, of course, migrants in in ever more, we may say, complex way. Suddenly, it turned out that first of all, he has an opinion about immigration, and secondly, that it's a relatively uh, challenging or or difficult opinion about immigration, where he was where he has been talking about, of course, a numbers of foreigners suddenly increasing and imposing their sensitivity, um, and and also he was giving many many kind of not not exactly true examples from 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 other european from other european from other european countries in which he was in which he was pointing to, to those things that immigration has actually has actually caused and obviously asking also a lot of rhetorical questions in terms of do you all want that this becomes reality in poland that we we somehow stop feeling, uh, stop feeling well in our country. There was also, of course, a lot of a lot of recon so-called recontextualization, we say diffusion of this discourse happening. So, for example, in, in various online posts, different members of the party, key members of the party, would be talking about this issue of migrant invasion, for example. Yeah, they would be recontextualizing different visions of 
and ideas and ideas of maps. But they would also that discourse would also include very often um, um, quite a lot of discussion again about, in a sense, Im imaginaries we may say of migrants in a very in a very negative way, up to the point of of, of using very um, we may say classic elements of of for example anti-Semitic discourse in 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 this discourse which effectively will be we may say to some extent or to large extent Islamophobic actually yeah so so using different elements of language which would be historically contingent but apparently also historically um, resonant. An important aspect, and this is something which we probably know quite well from the wider liberalism research, is also this whole arrival of this quasi-intellectualism to support those political ideas and political projects. So ever since we had in Poland an arrival of quite a lot of, for example, Christian Catholic driven intellectualism, which obviously not only will be showing that not only will be showing that 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 migrants are a problem, but also that in a sense that that migration is an element of a certain, we may say, we may say wider um, wider invasion. It's a, it's it's an element of a certain violence against against Christianity, which would be happening. And this would be probably one of the typical cases of the borderline discourse, where we may say the religious argumentation is actually used to to groom or to clad the the um, the, 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 to, to rationalize very often in, in, in a very peculiar way uh, the, the anti-immigration rhetoric. That would be the same case, for example, in a lot of, in a lot of Catholic, more or less radical media, where we, you, you would have a lot of discussion how, about, about, in a sense, Christian theological even argumentation, why migrants can or should be discriminated. Yeah? And there would also be other types of normalization happening. So, for example, there would be, there would be this whole normalization, which would be, we may say, generic. Where, we, where different fake news will start to be appearing, to be to be to be compiled to talk about to talk about to talk about a crisis with with refugees and refugees bringing um, bringing um, um, violence, um, also as element of we may say anti of, of, of strictly political competition. That was, for example, the case of criti crit criticism um, against many of the liberal we may say. Uh, mayors in Polish big cities in the regional elections in um, in 2000 in 2000 in 2018. But of course, as we as we pointed to before, this thing will very often have a very significant spillover moment. Yeah. So this discourse would also, we may say, go to um, go to the streets and be combined, recontextualized. We may say with other discourses, discourses very often of not only we may say Islamophobia but also white supremacy, fascism, and we know that a lot of a lot of this normalization has also happened. But it will also instigate this wider process, a bit of a process which we may call probably enemy of the month. Yeah. So this process where, where, where it's not only will be about migrants, it's not only will it not only will be about refugees, but in a sense where also other others, so to speak, will be will be identified even within the, the, the national community. So even it, it up to the point of obviously stigmatizing women, up to the point of stigmatizing uh, the LGBT, LGBTQI community and, and, and so on and so forth. So so up to the point of creating creating this discourse when in a sense there are many enemies. But we know that that discourse also has and, and, and in a sense um, relates to to that to that atmosphere of incitement, which obviously has created that situation when we have had justif justification, legitimation for the for the still ongoing refugee pushbacks on the Polish. Belarusian border, very paradoxically, at the same time as there was a lot of opening towards Ukrainian refugees, this process has still been going on on the um, on the northern, we may say, part of the of the of the Polish of the Polish eastern border. So we have a process which probably shows that there has been a lot of shift, that there has been a lot of accumulation, that there has been a lot of a lot of things, a lot of things happening and 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 and, and accelerating. So what probably uh, I've been trying to say is that is that probably discursive shifts, what they really try to do is to, is, is to, to a little bit kind of deal with, 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 this, with this old problem that, that if we hear that the research, the research about the liberalism or, or far right talks about discourse or narration, that we somehow only leave it at the level of language. And I think this is actually an attempt to connect discourse to practice in, in illiberalism research both theoretically and empirically in order to show the, the ontology really of the ever more complex and, and indeed historically contingent and strongly context dependent patterns of, 
of pre-legitimation of the liberal ideologies. What it also does is I think that through that concept of discursive shifts, we highlight that normalization is not only a rhetorical byproduct by a strategically intended very much recurrent discursive practically, practical element of, of the liberal dismantling of liberal, of liberal democracy. And that this also is very complex and operates at many levels. There will be obviously the political mainstreaming of the far right, but there would also be of course the intellectual pre-legitimation, a lot of, we may say, everyday discourse, enactments, recontextualizations of, I don't know, ideas related to, um, to, to exclusion. And probably also, finally, this enables following this whole manufacturing, we may say, and, and local global recontextualization of illiberalism as, as a very carefully crafted gradual process. It's actually a very challenging part of this research, because on the one hand, we all look for transnational patterns, similarities, comparative connections. But on the other hand, we know that this that this research becomes more and more heavy historically, contextually, in a nationally specific ways very often. And that of course makes it very makes it very challenging. So we can probably use this to trace and deconstruct the complexity and very much intended, I would say, fluidity of discourses, narratives, statements, but also actions related to liberal politics and, and logic. So, for example, this process of finding the other within and outside. Everybody can potentially be the other. Everybody can potentially be, um, be the enemy. Yeah? Um, and then, of course, retaining focus on not only the linguistic and narrative side of this process, but also, of course, on its contribution, we may say, on the more macro level to that moral panics and cumulative um, with what I call atmosphere of incitement, yeah, which is fueled, of course, by this liberal exclusionary logic at the macro level in politics, media, and so on. But also to talk about, to, to talk or look more specifically into the propensity of, of normalization to reach that spillover element, element moment and to, to, to remain over there, we may say. So, so when the normalized liberalism becomes part and a wider catalog of social, political, um, and, and, and very often also everyday values and, and actions. So how essentially a liberalism changes society on the ground. Good, thank you so much. And sorry for the Zoom problem. It's uh, <laughs> some, some, some of my traditions to have Zoom problems. So, so. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thank you so much. Yes, totally, uh, readable here. Thank you so much, Mika. I think you are just, it's really, you are just at the forefront of really what is the core of, I think, research now on illiberalism, which is to kind of articulate discourse and practices and this kind of normalization and the fact that it's, the frames may look global, but when you need to understand how they fit in a society, it's very local, mm -hmm. right? Each context is, is a very specific one. I often give that example that in France, one of these uh, um, kind of um, way of, of uh, framing things in a very soft way about migration has been all the, dis the issues about discussing, you know, school cafeteria. When you say school cafeteria mm -hmm. in France, it's look a very neutral yeah. mm -hmm. discussion. But if you are French and you know the context, you will understand that it's about Muslim children at school not wanting to eat pork. And should the public system adapt to the need of the community? So it's all kind of all this metaphorical proxy aspect, discourse, and proxy yeah. discourse and the uh, way it's really shaped in national context is really uh, uh, fascinating. I have several questions. Uh, I invite people who are online to ask questions in the chat. And if we have questions in the room, I'm happy to give you the floor uh, uh, first. Question in the room. Let me see in the chat. Yeah, one question, uh, 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 Michael, if I can begin with that you mentioned, which I think is a very important point that is not very often, often mentioned for the kind of the Central European context is that you had strong discourse about emigration yeah. first and the kind of the demograph demographic trauma of Central Europe, this kind of really big waves of people living really like since the, 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 the collapse of the iron current, mm -hmm. really so many people living and that already shaped the kind of the feeling of, you know, the nation as an ethnic body that is endangered by its own kind of shrinking. And so if you could articulate that and how we that kind of, create that kind of fertile vision of the nation in danger 
and then you have the immigration arriving, right? So how would you articulate this? Yeah. I, th I think the tradition of this has been such that that, that the emigration discourse, which which is long standing, there's there's there's, a, there's an absolutely humongous Polish intellectual discourse about it. For example, from the 19th century, which whoever went through Polish education system had to suffer from for mm -hmm. uh, for, for forever. Um, and 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 I think a very very important aspect of this was that this is a discourse which in lots of ways always had exactly the what, what you're mentioning this this element of a certain national victimization of the fact that a lot of Poles had to leave because of historical occurrences, because of partitions and, um, and so on and so forth. So it is a discourse which we may say in itself is, is, is perhaps not as directly problematic, but it's a discourse which has a very strong nationalistic propensity mm -hmm. in itself, Polish emigration discourse. And I think then in a sense, recontextualizing elements of that discourse, or at least building on it in, in, a, in, a, in a wider, we may say, um, intellectual sense as, as far as as far as relating it to to, 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 to more recent contemporary immigration into Poland that, 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 that there is of course there are of course certain patterns which you can which you can which you can very very easily use but but especially probably that idea of a, of a certain um, well really imagined a very Benedict Andersonian ideas mm -hmm. and very imagined national community and you know, that 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 can easily that can easily be created because because such as could be the vision historically of poles leaving because of nation being uh, endangered and of course threatened very often very often in real terms such as also very easily the vision of in a sense now some sort of national community and communion which is under threat yeah which is obviously which is obviously which is obviously under invasion yeah so that would be that would be um that would be certainly um certainly the key connection mm -hmm. the key connection i would say but of course that's not the only we may say reservoir from from which from which things were taken recently of course there is this huge tradition of other um, discriminatory, probably liberal and 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 profoundly anti-pluralistic discourses, which traditions of discourse against minorities, discourse um, um, of of different kind, which traditionally is is very easily enacted in the in the public domain, and of course all of this probably combined creates a, a very explosive explosive combination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had another question, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to give the floor in the room if we have questions. Do we? Yeah. Tom, take the mic for people in the who are online. Yeah. Thank you, the great folks. I'm Sam Yu, a postdoc uh, associate here uh, in the liberal liberalism studies program. Um, I was just wondering, so you know, all of the far right discourses sound familiar with me, uh, kind of you know, similar with all the other far right discourses you know observed across the European countries uh, in these days. Uh, I was just wondering, um, so can you kind of pinpoint who might be the biggest producers of these policies in Poland? Like, you know, you know these, 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 these policies have been existing, you know, over time, especially, you know, over the last two decades, but in other countries, especially countries like UK and France, uh, maybe, you know, the, uh, particular social groups mm -hmm. and influencers on social media have played the biggest role in kind of producing exaggerated discourses and highly you know, hostile discourses toward immigrant and you know, social minorities, right? So I was wondering if that was the case in Poland as well, like, you know, were there any kind of particular influential groups online uh, who just kind of intentionally producing you know, these discourses and, and try to kind of accelerate normalization process mm -hmm. among the citizens. Thanks. It's an extremely complex question because probably our job is, is mainly to, to, to deconstruct conspiracy theories rather than, than, than create them. And it's, um, I mean, we can obviously, and, and that's, but that's probably the challenge of this research. We can see a lot of similarities between different countries and different contexts. That would be especially about similarities in terms of countries which probably regionally would be somehow connected, similar. Um, the, the religious aspect would be very important. So if countries also, also have, I don't know, the same 
same religious landscape and so on. So I don't know. So that, that's why, for, for example, there could be at some point we, we published this special issue a few, a few years ago with Bodak about urbanism and Trumpism. Yeah? So in a sense that there would be different types of populism. So yeah? there would be more Eastern European, probably nationalistic, religiously also based or pre-legitimized populism on the one hand, and there would be different modes of more probably Trumpist, US-like, media, strongly mediatized far right um, um, here. So of course, there would be different types, but they would be in, in lots of ways, an extremely general and extremely cumulative types of things. And then the specific national variations will be will be very important. But that's something that's been spotted, I think, irrespective in a way of the regions. There's this quite uh, a very interesting work by, 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 by Kasmuda and Cristobal Rovira Cardassar about, about also, about also the, 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 the um, South American populisms and Latin American populism, where we also see a lot of connections, but, 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 but still things are being accommodated on the ground. And I think also what, 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 what a lot of us have spotted as, a, as a, the biggest challenge exactly in this research is that we somehow want those models. We, we, we will somehow try to agree on, on, on certain ideas and notions. But then once we take them on the ground, they would differ very, very significantly from, from the very foundational notions in this research. Well, populism has been one of such research. It's become so diffuse and so inflated at a certain point that, that people, I think, started abandoning it for, for the sake that it started meaning everything. And so. But also the understandings of populism would be kind of covert, non, non overt kind of political, social, and so on and so forth. So, so that would show you, in a sense, in terms of in terms of, in terms of why the far right transnational connections that the, the, there is the, there is there is a lot of a lot of challenges. But 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 obviously there are connections because we do see things reappearing. A lot of, for example, of this infusion of Islamophobia, which happened, which happened across European countries, has been happening for for quite some time. But also we have to to see that there's a historical contextual importance here. In Central and Eastern Europe, a lot of far right obviously arrives with, late, arrives probably in, with, with that second wave of whatever, but this is not the first time far right arrives in Europe. You know, already in the late 80s, 90s, or um, we have many countries, Austria, Austria, Sweden, where there are cases of, of far right parties. Yeah, so, so, so in a sense, and they also, dis, we may say, discovered immigration and, and anti-immigration rhetoric at different points. Central and Eastern European countries have done this only a few years ago, as, I, as I've been showing in case of Poland. But in other countries, this is really a, a, by now a decade-long discourse, yeah, several de decades even very often. So, so it's, it's, it's an extremely complex picture. And I think, and, 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 and one thing which probably we have to remain doing is, is calling for, of course, attempts to somehow find the connection, but also for not dehistoricizing and decontextualizing, because that's the biggest danger. That's actually what I think the liberal discourse wants us to do. Yeah, and if don't see a problem, don't attach the problem to reality, yeah? and because then it becomes abstract, becomes diffuse, and in a sense it, it weakens. I think the the intellectual analytical position on it. Yeah. Hmm. We had a question online on the on the meeting about the the media that you mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. this the, the the role of the media in kind of contributing, framing uh, anti-immigration um, discourse, and so a lot of research has been on social media. Mm -hmm. But you were showing a lot, and I think the the tabloid <clears throat> culture has been understudied, maybe on the role it played in kind of contributing to this yeah. uh, uh, framing, and and so there is all this kind of commercial aspect yeah. of tabloid, right? That I think. There is a commercial aspect of illiberality to illiberalism, right? That it's clickbait, you make money, and so on. So if you could develop on this kind of the, the tabloid aspect you had for the UK, I think is a, yeah. Is a so I, mean, I mentioned I mentioned UK. There's a history yeah. obviously of this. I also I also shown some I've shown some examples from Poland. It, it's a complex thing because I think I mean this is exactly the point that, you, that, that you're making, uh, Marin. Because what what happens is a lot of this depends on the political economy of the media, but also on their contextual importance and how that also then connects to, to I think, the, the political processes and logics. So effectively, the question would be, say in a Polish case, the, the real question would be about the, the electorate that, that is being spoken to, that is being addressed, yeah? And for example, a lot of peace electorate, traditionally, now it's also changing, this becomes much younger, 
has been much more has been much more older sections of the electorate and has been also um, sections in the areas which not necessarily will be fully we may say mediatized in an online sense so that's why also their focus on classic tv on on on, on newspapers but of course it's not only them who do it but also media very eagerly of mm. course jump on that bandwagon and i think we had developments in the us in the mm. last few days which we see me actually media jumping on and off mm. that but that, that that bandwagon in different ways but 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 i think that that that's that's a, a very crucial i mean it's a, it's a question which is exactly under study and i probably don't really have a specific response but i think it's a question which also shows this whole idea about media become a bit of a, a a bit of a separate really field and a field which is driven by its own logic and, and a field which, which which in lots of ways selects its own political affinities in a very inconsistent way but what it of course causes down the line is is is, is also a lot of inconsistency consistency in the electoral behavior and i think a lot of this has actually contributed to to the rise of the far right, to the wider probably normalization of liberalism, because, because it meant that the usual sides of where certain voices will be expressed are not really as coherent as they used to be anymore. The social media will include, will include very liberal, um, um, a lot of illiberal voices, tabloids will include that, but also broadsheet press, yeah, and I mean very, very traditional press. But I think it would be very strongly calibrated towards also who the audiences are, how the audiences behave then politically, TV viewers, obviously, newspaper readers, if in a specific country there's also a tradition. Britain is traditionally a country with, with a very high level of, of newspaper readership. Mm -hmm. Other countries are, mm -hmm. the newspapers are almost gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's, a, it's an extremely complex thing, but it is, you very rightly point to that, it's, it, it is a very neoliberal question. Lots mm -hmm. of it. It's a question related to also political economy of the media and how they, in a sense, their political opportunism is, is, mm -hmm. is closely related to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the, the, the kind of micro targeting yeah. of audience contribute right exactly. to this feeling that there is no more unifying frame that work for all the citizenry right you speak to so many micro targeted micro audience audiences. with so many audiences that you kind of exclude yes, the yes. citizenry mm -hmm. in a sense in what they share yeah. all together as a citizen uh, um, uh, another question we have specifically on uh, uh, Poland this time so the peace, of course, is a key actor for Poland, but it could lose the next election, potentially. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's say at least you have a you still have a strong opposition in Poland to kind of liberal domination that you don't find so clearly, for example, in in Hungary. So how can we envision what would be the legacy, right? The day this kind of liberal government are leaving power, what is remaining, what has dramatically changed? And I think the, the discursive shifts are the yeah, key, yeah, are yeah, one yeah. of the key uh, well, uh, elements. The legacy would be extremely complex because of course, one thing that happened given it's already been two terms, um, uh, two parliamentary ter ter terms that, that they've done, mm -hmm. is of course that as they go along, the change becomes not only more profound and deeper in let's say legal or policy aspect, but also in terms of normalization aspect, yeah. yeah? So there is ever more, we may say, maybe not acceptance, but definitely complacency, mm -hmm. definitely, definitely, definitely in a sense, this feeling, yeah, so things are happening there, um, they, they might might not have impact on us. So there is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very problematic, problematic, I think, development, because what it, what it causes is it, it, it and that probably for me might be one of the reasons why peace might actually win and um, i'm mm -hmm. not saying it will and I, and I hope it won't but but <laughs> probably but but it's but what will happen is effectively is effectively uh, this this complacency this probably um this um, I don't know, this engagement of, of the electorate might be very problematic as those normalization processes have probably deepened yeah so so i think that that would have that would have that would have been quite complex because um, um, yeah, I mean, this, this, this would be, and, and, and the question is, I mean, if, 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 the, if the change doesn't happen now, that would be by the next possible time, it would be 12 years of, of government. That's extremely long. Mm -hmm. That's extremely lot. And I mean, in, in most of countries, let's take US, I mean, we know that eight, eight years is a lot. Yeah. So, so, and, and four years is a lot and eight is particularly so, so, but if we reach, for example, a point when this would be well over a decade, that, that would be 
that would be a very, um, a, a very complex situation. Um, so we'll see. And we know that in other countries where we have seen this, this sort of the change not happening, let's say Hungary, it's, mm -hmm. it, they exactly are, are at this point of 12, 13 years, I think yeah. that they're approaching now. Uh, we see that that it's 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 already a, a fully different mindset that in a sense the the state the country operates mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And a question that is of specific interest here because we do a lot on 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 Russia and Ukraine mm -hmm. and the war, of course, is that how much in the Polish context the war and the focus on Ukraine and the kind of reintegration of Poland inside an EU framework where it looks not like you know the bad illiberal mm -hmm. guy but like the forefront. Yeah, of kind of yeah. NATO defense, how does that play in these kind of narratives? And the fact also that Poland received so many Ukrainian yeah. uh, uh, yeah. immigrants, and I know of course there have been narratives about the, the uh, Ukrainian immigrants were not received the same way are uh, migrants from the Middle East. But how is the this kind of illiberal narrative shifting or not shifting because of the war? I think I think at the moment it's 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 of course there was this there was this and I think it's it's very commendable what happened vis-a-vis -vis Ukrainian Ukrainian refugees and I think it's it's been a really great reaction. Um, the question is though we know that 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 those discourses have tendency to shift very quickly and I think mm -hmm. we already have now that have, have had now this longer debate about this economic economic aspect the famous Ukrainian grains and 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 which which with with an obviously market mm -hmm. protectionist um, framing. Um, um, framing of things. So I think I think uh, we will see wherever the context mm -hmm. in, in 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 lots of ways, in lots of ways takes us. Yeah, it probably what what, you, what you're saying is right that that this um, especially very humanitarian reaction towards Ukrainian refugees has probably softened that image a little mm -hmm. bit. But it of course hasn't turned away from from a lot of actions which have were still mm -hmm. have still been happening in the country. You know, the the in terms of our constitutional mm -hmm. system system changes and 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 so on and so forth. So what, as 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 far as this was happening, there were also other things probably happening at the same time. So it's difficult to say it's it's going for for the better um, or for the worse. But but I think I think it, it, it's it's about a certain complexity and also mm -hmm. and also you know what. Um, what will appear as next uh, in this in this process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me read a, a question from the, the the chat. Thank you for the engaging mm -hmm. talk. In your introduction, you mentioned the rise of the far right globally. I have a question we follow from that, which is about the international or better transnational aspect of the discursive shift you described. To what extent are peace-backed institutions mm -hmm. such as the Institute of National Remembrance? or diaspora group and organization in other country involved in this process of normalization? Well, it's again a complex, a very complex issue, I think. So it's like this, I mean, the, the Institute of National Remembrance obviously kind of existed before peace, yeah? So it's, it's, it's also one of probably those institutions which was strongly taken over, yeah? And I think that's also what, what relates to your previous question, I think about, 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 about in a sense, a, a, a discourse, um, Kind of, kind of. As long as far right probably remains in power, it, it kind of becomes ever more pervasive and ever probably deeply pervasive in the in the state system. Yeah? And I think that that makes things um, more and more, uh, more and more complex. But then also more and more difficult to change where the change really to um, to occur and happen. We're still a few months away, I think, from the election. So I think a lot of things, a lot of things can um, can happen. So 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 we we'll, we will we will simply have to see. I wouldn't like to probably internationalize mm. this process because we probably end up um, end up very quickly in a, in a different conspiracy theory territories, which which we should not be which we should not be doing. But I mean, of course, we, we've seen that that certain patterns are, again appear and reemerge. So so in this case, politics of memory has been used mm -hmm. quite extensively in mm -hmm. in so many in so many cases and places. You know, Hungary and so on and so forth. We, we've seen, of course, this are no constitutional dismantling processes taken to other countries. So 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 this is um, this is this is I think very very complex. But I think I think it's a very I mean it's a, it's a it's 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 a, it's a I mean. Here, the pervasiveness is, is, is really a, a problematic aspect. But in a sense, the, the longer the longer certain illiberal ideology uh, underpins, kind of we may we may say we may say go, go, governance, the more pervasive it becomes, and the more also in lots of lots of ways exactly normalized it, it becomes, and that will be dif more difficult to probably reintroduce um, any new mm -hmm. normative order that 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 that, that yeah that, that should could replace it mm. 
So it brings me exactly, that's perfect to, to uh, the last question, which is a more kind of policy question, but we are in Washington DC. So that's <laughs> the way we tend to do things here about how do we retake the semantic space back or how advocacy group or the liberal audience are trying to retake control about these discursive shifts. I, I often mention that as an, as an example of a discussion I had some day with the uh, um, LGBT advocacy group, they were telling me like we lost the battle on the notion of family. And then now oh. family is associated to traditional family. Why we should have been able to say inclusive family, for example, but keep the family semantic space yeah. on our side and we lost it. And now it's very difficult to retake it back. So how do you think this, I mean, I mean, probably How, this, as scholars, yeah, yeah, yeah. can we study the these kind of battles for for uh, uh, semantic spaces or between different groups? I think I think what's very important is that I mean it's it's a very complex process, and I think there is no simple answer to this. But but I think what, what's what's the key problem is is in a way to try and 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 uh, try and undo whatever happened. So if we say that one of the key things that happened within the, the wider framework of liberalism has been, for example, this, this conceptual colonization of liberal democratic notions by, say, the far right and the liberals, has been this, this whole con conceptual flip side, where our job has to be this, this, this enlightenment, this Aufklärung, which will be, which will be so to speak, directed to, to show that, no, their origin is, is or should be or could be um, liberal, it should mm -hmm. be democratic, it should be about, about equality, it should be about inclusion and egalitarianism, but it, sh and it shouldn't be about kind of particular interests, it shouldn't be about exclusionary ideas of society, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So in a sense, try and probably undo this whole conceptual flip siding, which mm -hmm. has been which has been ongoing and which um, which which has been happening, and of course, with to which to which different again sides and different um, uh, different actors have um, different actors have contributed. I mean, another matter is also I mean this is hugely challenging, but of course, I think the very classic response, for, for example, such as I don't know, strengthening the liberal democratic civil society is obviously extremely um, extremely important. Also, as I think that battle has also to some extent been lost because what we have seen because of I don't know development of civil society mm -hmm. in, in, in recent in recent years and it's been good two three decades of that actually um, and then it's mediatization online i mean of course this 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 ground also very easily can be taken over yeah so in a sense we have to remain in lots of ways and probably hopefully that that research also contributes to that we have to remain in in lots of ways mindful that it's it's not it's not a battle so to speak in, in on one ground it, it it has to include different different areas different social fields different fields of of governance exactly mm -hmm. policy um policy making intellectual exchange and so on and so forth where we're in a sense strengthening of the liberal democratic voice is necessary yeah? because probably if, if if a focus is given to one or the other area things will happen in the other and in, in 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 another two and then be recontextualized very mm -hmm. quickly so mm -hmm. I think that is that is effectively what's yeah what's 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 what will be my very uh, elusive response. <laughs> that sounds mm. yeah that's that I think is an excellent answer because it shows the complexity right that it has to happen at so many levels. Mm -hmm. Maybe a last question about what are the next step for your own research. So at the moment we 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 we're doing we're doing research also trying to do research on Sweden, which is a bit which is a bit a bit more yeah. complex. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's a it's, it's a much more is a much more we may say subtle change that we're observing uh, but that is that is the project but I think I think I would also like to continue this work exactly on this more on this on this wider cross-field analysis mm -hmm. of, of liberalism and especially this kind of discourse conceptual aspects of it so how notions have been have been we may say reappropriated misappropriated recontextualized so yeah mm -hmm. so but, so it seems there's a lot of work still to do yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but that's great work thank, thank you. you so much thank Michael so much for, for joining us thank it you. was a, a really thank excellent you. discussion and I think it's bringing so many things that we have been uh, 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 trying to think here and you you really had so many kind of great research and thank you for yeah, mentioning everything I'm sure many people I see in the chat people asking like how can we get the slide how can we get the references <laughs> so it generated a lot of uh, discussion so thank you so much thank for being so with much. us thank today and, and thank you everybody Very for fun. joining us today and we hope to see you soon for some other events at the liberalism study program thank you and bye-bye thank you